Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to SOAS early on a Saturday morning for an unusual event, a symposium in honor of Ibn Arabi. And I'd like to thank, start by thanking Richard Twinch, who is here with us from the Ibn Arabi Society, for giving um, SOAS the chance to host such an event. I am uh, Stefan Sperl, that's my name. I am the head of the Department of the Near Middle East here at SOAS. And um, I'm hosting the conference, but I should say that all the hard work behind the scene has been done by Richard. Now, in introducing this conference, I was frankly bewildered. How can one introduce um, one of the greatest thinkers and most influential thinkers that the Arabic and Islamic world has produced? How can one do this adequately? And frankly, I was bewildered. And in the end, I asked myself, whom would I compare Ibn Arabi to in the culture that I was brought up in, Europe and Germany in particular? And I realized I wouldn't compare him to any philosopher or theologian, not even to a writer. I would compare him to a musician, and in particular to Johann Sebastian Bach. Yes, astonishing, isn't it? <laughs> well, there are three reasons. First of all, they were both, they left behind an extraordinarily prolific work. Bach, more than a thousand compositions. Ibn Arabi, more than 350 writings in poetry and prose. And they all revolve around one theme, man's relationship to God, and more specifically, how to make the human heart receptive for the divine presence, and even more specifically, how to purify the heart through divine love. That is what they do share. Then there's another aspect. Both of them derive their insights from two analogous sources. In the case of Bach, it's biblical scripture. In the case of Ibn Arabi, it's the Quran, because in fact this great work of Ibn Arabi can be seen as nothing less than one giant expedition through the meaning of the Quran. And then there's yet another thing. Both of them derive their in, much of their message and their insight from the medium in which they worked. In the case of Bach, it's harmony and counterpoint, the, te the technical raw material of music that he explored with, ex with extraordinary discipline and depth. And in the case of an Arabi, it is the Arabic language. The Arabic language that he also explored and from which, out of which he, so to say, distilled and refined some of, his most, some of his most striking insights. It is the morphology, the syntax, the etymology of Arabic, which is like a, um, an, a soil out of which Arab, Ibn Arabi distilled his, his, uh, many of his visions. And, Therefore, he is really an astounding, creative writer, and that really is one reason why I see him more, comparing him more to a musician like Bach than to any other theoretician. And then there is another third element. Um, both of them are representatives of a certain mystical philosophy, which can be traced back through many, many different stages to a common origin, <coughs> in the philosophy of late antiquity, and in particular also I should like to mention here the figure of Plotinus, this great Egyptian philosopher who wrote in Greek, who lived in Rome, and whom we can consider justly, I think, the father of mysticism, of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. This brings us, of course, to philosophy, and philosophy is actually the topic of today, because Ibn Arabi's work mostly covertly, but often also overtly, is in dialogue with and also in confrontation with that philosophical heritage that uh, streamed into the Islamic tradition from antiquity and contributed to the rise of Islamic theology, Islamic philosophy, and Islamic mysticism. The Philosophical topics that will be discussed today, as you will have seen from, from the program, don't only relate to the past. There are issues which are burning issues to the present day. I see in the program references to quantum mechanics, to the rediscovery of God after Nietzsche. 
So the issues we are going to hear about are issues of the present time, uh, inspired by a great thinker of the past. And in this context, I'd like very much to expand my thanks to the four speakers who have come here uh, to speak to us today about uh, this topic. And now I'd like to give the word to Richard from the Ibn Arabi Society to tell you more about the society. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you. Thank you very much to Stefan Spurl, who's been a wonderful support and um, a great client, because as soon as you ask him a question, he gives you a response. It's, it's wonderful. Um, and to SOAS for being so generous in um, donating us this space so we can uh, enable it to throw open the doors and uh, allow people in who wouldn't necessarily be able to come to a conference of this uh, quality. And uh, I'd like to thank the speakers for working hard and traveling far. And um, I'm sure we'll all benefit from their wisdom during the day. And I'd just like to mention two people who can't be here. Uh, the first is a lady called Salima Kavanagh, who has been a member of the society for many years and uh, many, many years, and uh, who held uh, FUSUS reading groups in London for over 20 years, um, and she sadly died uh, in the autumn. And also, uh, I'd like to mention Bushra Fulkan, who is a lady from Pakistan who is with us in spirit. Um, she tried so hard to get here, and we tried to uh, help her with the letters for visa applications, but in the end it wasn't enough. And she said she's going to try again and again and again to come. You know, she really wants to be here with us, and so she's thinking of us as we speak. And uh, I'd also like to just mention it's uh, Hida's day today. Uh, Hida is the, um, the guide of those who have no master, who go directly to God. And he was one of the great uh, spiritual inspirers of Moses, as we will hear later, and also of Ibn Arabi, who met him on several, if not many, occasions. So that, that's, again, an auspicious day we, we arrive here. Now, the Ibn Arabi society has been going for uh, 40 years and um, was really brought together to uh, bring the work of Ibn Arabi to the West, and now it's going back to the East, but to make Ibn Arabi much better known, because he was really not known 40 years ago, apart from a few people uh, in small pockets. So uh, it's an international society. We have branches in America and in Spain, both very active. And uh, it doesn't have thousands and thousands of members, but it's, it's bringing together the people who are really concerned working in the field. And the other thing um, that's, that's happened is that um, we've been, one of the things we do is collect the works of Ibn Arabi, which are, as we've heard, are very uh, extensive and detailed, and a lot of them in his own hand, unparalleled, really, in any sphere, and um, from that time. And uh, our scholars, Stephen and Jane, uh, have been busy over the last 10, 15 years collecting these manuscripts in digital form, making them available, cataloging them, and making them available to scholars around the world, first to produce critical editions, um, and then for those to be translated into different languages. So all that's been ongoing over the last uh, 40 years. So um, it's been a priv privilege to be part of it and watch it happen and grow. So a uh, little plug, you can join the society outside. <laughs> so um, we have a, a, a rich uh, day ahead of us. And um, I would just like to get some sort of sense of you know, why, picking up on Stefan's uh, 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 point about Bach and um, 
things that I just like to quote actually from Maria de Chilis, who, who was uh, uh, who's speaking a little later in her book uh, Free Will and Predestination in Islamic Thought, and she's looking at the different ways in which uh, she, she's talking about creation in this sense. We're talking about knowledge, really, but um, this uh, idea is of wujud, of existence, of, of oneness of being. And uh, I would just qu- like to quite get a sense of where if there be, if there's a qualitative jump that he makes uh, into a completely different realm from where people have been before. So that is, this is why he's like referred to as the Sheikh al-Akbar, because he's the pinnacle, the point at which before everything led up to him and after him, everyone refers back to him. Uh, particularly in the Islamic world. So, so, so this is from Maria. Whilst existence in itself conveys the idea of something which is realised and hence limited by its own essence, the Akbarian, that is Akbarian Sheikh al-Akbar, Ibn Arabi, absolute wujud, being, is plenitude of possibilities. It is an infinite and transforming energy. It is an implosive and explosive force which is open to the illimitability of ultimate, inextinguishable, and unadulterated oneness. So, we stand in the presence of this um, uh, enormous ideas, and um, we look forward to uh, what will unfold from the day.